Um, professor Owen Kotler is, of course, a very esteemed professor of law. He was also, um, he was also the Minister of Justice of the Canadian government. Um, he is, in the very positive, most positive sense, a true liberal and social democrat, and someone who not only defends the causes of human rights around the world, but obviously is a strong and staunch supporter of Israel. He's spoken out very clearly on the issues of Israel delegitimization and against BDS, without becoming too dug down in the sort of hysterical debate that we often have, you know, that the right wing are fascists and the left wing are traitors. He is a very calm and balanced but very firm voice in the middle of this debate. And it is to his great credit and to this university's great credit that we are able to host him here to give him an honorary doctorate and for him to talk about some of his work in the areas of human rights and the areas of political prisoners, as he's put his title, um, from... Sharansky to Mandela and probably a lot in between. There's probably no better person in the world who could talk about this topic from a very balanced and from a very objective point of view from Professor Erwin Kotler. Just before you start, I do apologise in the name of Professor Kami, who um, is going to be slightly late for this event. and She does apologise, but she will be joining us later. Um, and with, uh, because we are running late on time, um, I'm going to allow Erwin to take over and present his lecture. We may have time for two or three questions at the end, but I can't guarantee it right yet because we do have a strict timetable. We have to be away from here and get ready for the honorary doctorate ceremony afterwards. So with no further ado, I am delighted and honoured to introduce Professor Erwin Kotler. David, thank you for those kind words of introduction. Uh, what you may not have known is that I come from a Litvish Misnagid background, so that accounts for what they may have said about me. That was the subtext uh, to their remarks. I must say that I'm really humbled and moved by the privilege of giving this lecture and the uh, perspective conferral of an honorary uh, degree. And I want to express my appreciation to Ben Gurion University to its leadership, its president, Rifka Karmi, to its academic and, and lay uh, leadership. Also to my family who's here, my wife, who's Ariella, has been in the trenches with me all these years, though, as I always say, not always on the same side, but <laughs> in, that, in that sense, a real, as a connecto. Uh, to my son, who's uh, here, uh, Yoni, uh, you know, he always inspires me with his wicked sense of humor. Two months ago, I was in, in Europe in a conference on uh, rights and democracy, and he was in Geneva, and he was passing through, and I said, uh, Yanchi, we're having this conference on rights and democracy. Would you like to come? He said, are you speaking that? I said, yes, actually, I am speaking. He says, sorry, I've heard it all before. <laughs> uh, and then added, remember that it's a new generation. You can't use your 10 points. Two points, and we're out of there, not listening anymore. So thank you, Yoni, for your healthy admonitions over the year. My daughter, who will soon be arriving with my uh, grandchildren, uh, my friends and, uh, who are here, and, and I just, if you'll pardon me, just, if I just may single out uh, several of them, if I will single all others out, I may never get to the remarks, but uh, my friend, who happens to be uh, my cousin, we were bonded from birth, uh, Robert Elman, who headed up the Canadian Friends of Ben Gurion University as its chair, my closest friend, Gordon Eckenberg, who as well came from uh, Canada here, who also amongst the leadership of, among other things, of the Canadian Friends of Ben Gurion University. And of course, those who've been mentioned, uh, Morai, Rabotai, my friends, my mentors, uh, Elika and Aaron uh, Barak. Uh, I have to say that when I use the words Mikom Lamdai Hiskalti, that I've learned from whoever I have met, uh, I have been enriched uh, by their friendship as well as their inspiring leadership legally, morally, intellectually, and culturally over the years. Thank you for being with us today as well. Uh, David, I want to say that in your introduction, only one thing was uh, left out, but it's the one thing you didn't know. And that is, I do begin my talks by paying tribute to my 
first teachers, uh, my parents, Zichronam Libracha, blessed memory. It was my father who taught me, as I say from Kin Vaison, when I was too young to appreciate the profundity of his remarks, when he said to me that tzedek tzedek tirdof, and he said it to me in Hebrew, that the pursuit of justice, as he put it, is equal to all the other commandments combined. This, as he put it, must be the vishinamtam levanecha. This is what you must teach unto your children. But it was my mother who, when she would hear my father saying these things, would say to me that if you want to pursue justice, you have to understand, you have to feel the injustice about you. You have to go in and about your community and beyond and feel the injustice and combat the injustice. Otherwise, the pursuit of justice remains a theoretical abstraction. And I suspect that it was because of these teachings nurtured by those who then uh, taught me in Jewish day school and high school, university and the like, they then got involved in the two great human rights struggles of the second half of the 20th century. The struggle against apartheid and the struggle of human rights in the Soviet Union, including in particular the struggle for Soviet Jewry, and got involved with the two political prisoners who became the voice, the face, the identity, the vision of those struggles, Nelson Mandela in South Africa and Anatoly <coughs> Sharansky in the former Soviet Union. And to appreciate the impact of liberating political uh, prisoners, and that's why we have the notion of that, you know, pidyon shurim, that for the freeing of political prisoners, you're allowed even to transgress the Sabbath. That Nelson Mandela endured 27 years in a South African prison and returned to preside not only over the dismantling of apartheid, but to become the president of the first democratic, egalitarian, non-racial South Africa. And Anatoly Sharansky emerged to come on Aliyah to Israel to become a member of Knesset and cabinet, now the chair of the Jewish agency. And I got involved in both of those struggles in the mid-70s. And let me begin with a moment with Anatoly uh, Sharansky. Because to people here in this country, Sharansky is known as the leader of the Refusenik movement. And as I said, who then came here on Aliyah. But I have to tell you, as someone who is tracking human rights in the Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union in the 70s, Sharansky was known to me then as the leader of five separate movements. And it's important to understand this because then you'll understand the real nature of why, as Andrei Sakharov, sometimes called the father of human rights in the former uh, Soviet Union, why he spoke of Sharansky and said that the trial of Sharansky was a trial of human rights in the former Soviet Union, that they wanted to quarantine the voice of human rights. And that's why Sharansky was tried and convicted of both the charges of treason and anti-Soviet slander and agitation. Because Sharansky was amongst the leaders of the Helsinki watch groups in the former Soviet Union that gave birth to the expression Kfutsak Tanate Shanet Olam. A small group can transform the world. And it was this small group that brought about, if I can use a Marxist metaphor, the withering away of the former Soviet Union. He was a leader in the democracy movement together with Sakharov. He was a leader of the ethnic, religious, and national cultural movements. He was a leader of the other political prisoners, defending other political prisoners. And finally, yes, the fifth, he was the leader of the dissident Aliyah <coughs> struggle for Soviet Jewry. So in effect, there were few people in the former Soviet Union that embodied the human rights struggle in all its configurations at the time. And so I became involved in his struggle, and I want to use both his and Nelson Mandela to, number one, share with you some vignettes of that struggle, and remarkably enough, as I'll get to, how the two cases of Sharansky and Mandela actually ended up intersecting one with another. The whole is underpinned by an advocacy model for the defense of political prisoners, which I'll share with you. And then secondly, conclude with a never again declaration that was uh, recently adopted by a group of, of jurists uh, who were participating in a historic legal symposium at Jagiellonian University in Krakow, uh, who adopted, because we use the term 
never again, but it keeps happening again and again and again, and it has become an idle slogan. So this group of jurors, parliamentarians and the like, issued a series of undertakings for a real never again uh, declaration, and I'll share that with you, which will be done for me for the first time. So let me begin with the uh, Sharansky uh, case. In 1978, I developed a legal brief based on the first part of the model of Andrei Sakharov said the advocacy model, to mobilize shame against the human rights violator. And to mobilize that shame by exposing and unmasking the violations, in this instance, of the Soviet government of its own legal system, not uh, Canadian or American law, but its own legal system, as we did just two weeks ago when the Foreign Minister of Canada, Stefan Dion, took with him a legal brief from me regarding the release of imprisoned Saudi Arabian blogger Raif uh, Badawi, whom I'm uh, now representing. Again, a brief based on Saudi Arabian law, on Islamic law, not on its violations of Canadian or American law. So in our brief, we sought to document some 20 violations by the Soviet Union. The great thing about the Soviet Union at the time is that it had a magnificent constitution and it had all the rights that you would wish for. And we were able to point out how they were violating each of their own undertakings in their uh, constitution in every uh, particular, as we sought to expose not only the falsity but the absurdity of the Soviet uh, prosecution. That was in 1978. In 79, and this brings me to the second part of the model, invoke the support where you can of your own government. The Canadian government at the time arranged for me to appear before the uh, Soviet Constitutional Court. However, one day before I was to appear, which would have been unprecedented had that appearance uh, been allowed, I was arrested, detained, interrogated, and expelled from the Soviet Union. I was brought out to a, a breakneck speed, which was worried me even more than the arrest, uh, to the Soviet airport, alighted onto a Japanese airliner, which was going fortunately to London and not to the Far East, to the surprise of the Japanese attendants to whom I said, I'm, when they asked me for my boarding pass, I said, I'm sorry, I'm being boarded in rather unusual circumstances by the KGB. But I said to them, I'd like you to do two things. Uh, if you can call the Canadian embassy, tell them I'm being expelled. And if you can contact uh, Dan Fisher, Moscow correspondent for Los Angeles Times, and tell them I won't be able to make it for dinner. <laughs> when I arrived in London, and I think the Soviets know this, you know that if you are expelled, you'll feel a terrible sense that you have betrayed those who have uh, you've left behind a sense of, of, of failure because they seized all my documents, all the documentary evidence, witness testimony, not only with Sharansky, but other refuseniks in the former Soviet Union. So when I uh, got to London, I, I called uh, my wife, and I was recently married, and sheepishly said to her, I said, Ariella, uh, don't tell anybody, uh, you know, I've been expelled from the Soviet Union, I'm, I'm here in London. She said, what do you mean don't tell anybody? The story is all over the world. Dan Fisher <laughs> broke the story, and nobody knew who I was, but everybody knew at that time Sharansky was an international cause celeb. And so I became, as his lawyer, the Andy Warhol, everybody can be famous uh, for 15 minutes uh, situation. But then she told me, the officials of the Canadian embassy are looking for you. And what happened was, because the Soviets had put out all of these false allegations that I was a spy uh, coming to uh, the Soviet Union on behalf of another spy, Anatoly Sharansky, that I was consorting with hooligans like Andrei Sakharov, etc. The Canadian government wanted to allow me the opportunity to set the record straight. So they organized a press conference for me in London. And afterwards, when I flew back to Canada, the foreign minister at the time, Flora MacDonald, in a symbolic move, met me at the airport and announced that Canada was suspending all bilateral Helsinki agreements with the former Soviet Union because of the imprisonment of Sharansky and because of my expulsion. It tells you that when a government will act on principle, then a government can be a, a, a compelling part of this advocacy model, which leads me to the third part, and that was the internationalization of advocacy. And here you see the help of family. Avital Sharansky became Anatoly Sharansky's effective advocate while he was uh, in prison a very compelling 
eloquent, persuasive advocate that allowed us to internationalize the case and cause for Sharansky and others. And the fourth thing was the mobilization of parliamentarians. There are other parts of this model, but I'll close with this particular shared story which sums it up. Anatoly Sharansky was released in February 1986. It was recently the 30th anniversary of his release. And I was always wondering, what role did Gorbachev play in this? Because Gorbachev became president of the Soviet Union in 1985. Sharansky was released at the beginning of 1986. So I had an opportunity to be on a panel with Gorbachev some years later, and I put the question to him, you know, what role did he have, if any, in the release of Anatoly Sharansky? And he shared with me a very interesting vignette, which speaks uh, to an advocacy model in the release of political prison. He said, you know, uh, when I was the Secretary of Minister of Agriculture in the former Soviet Union, he said 1984, he said, you won't believe this, I never heard of Anatoly Sharansky. He may have been a household word in Canada, but in the former Soviet Union, I never heard of him. I came to Canada, he said, in 1984, to appear before the Canadian Parliamentary Committee on Agriculture. And after uh, they asked me a few questions on agriculture, they started to ask me questions about this guy, Sharansky. I didn't know what they were talking about. He said, I left the Canadian Parliamentary buildings, and outside there was this big demonstration on behalf of Anatoly Sharansky. I then was hosted by the Canadian Minister of Agriculture, Eugene Whelan, and he kept talking about this Sharansky. He said, well, a year later, I became president of the Soviet Union, and so I asked for his file. I ordered up his file. He said, I looked at the file. He said, yes, he was a troublemaker, but he wasn't a criminal. And then he added the crucial words. He said, and it was costing us economically, politically, our legitimacy to keep him in prison. So I ordered his release in our own national self-interest. And so when our foreign minister, Stefan Dion, went to Saudi Arabia two weeks ago, I said, Stefan, when you're there, there's a new government now in Saudi Arabia, a new king, there's a new prime minister in Canada. Saudi Arabia is properly being criticized for its human rights uh, violations. You're arriving there uh, just before uh, Ramadan. They may see it as being in their self-interest to make a gesture now to release Raif Badawi to Canada, where his wife and children have refugee status. And the brief I've given you speaks in respect of their legal system. One can always speak in respect of the legal system. It's what they do with the legal system that's a problem. And maybe, who knows, you might be able to uh, secure uh, his release. So that's the model. And the model has, of course, a civil society model. In Sharansky's case and in other uh, political prisoners, the family of the political prisoner is a crucial part because, and that's Raif Badawi's wife and self header now becomes his face and identity externally. But it's also, we had, and there may be some people in this room at the time, a very important and formidable group called the 35s. They were women of the age of 35 at that time in London, in Ottawa, in, in different countries in the world who were advocating for Anatoly Sharansky's release, along with the student struggle for Soviet Jewry, along with academics and scientists and lawyers and the like. And when Sharansky was released and he was asked to what did he owe his release, he said, housewives and students. Housewives might have been somewhat of a politically incorrect word. Women and students. And he was right about the role of a critical mass of civil society can play in working and making representations to their counterparts abroad. Let me get to the case of Nelson Mandela, how the case is intersected. In 1981, I came to South Africa as a guest of the anti-apartheid movement. And the students at Wits University, actually the law students, asked me if I might like to give a lecture on the Sharansky case. And I said I'd be happy to give a lecture, but I would like to give it on the topic, if Sharansky, why not Mandela? But I said Mandela at that time was a banned person in South Africa. And as I said to them, I don't want to get anybody here in trouble because if I speak on that topic, it might be somewhat problematic for the students here at the university and others. And they said, no, 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 no problem. We'll be delighted. And so posters went up all over, banners, if Sharansky, why not Mandela? And I gave uh, the lecture and my wife who was there uh, would tell you I suddenly disappeared after that lecture because I got arrested 
in South Africa uh, for speaking on that topic. And while I was being detained, uh, one of the <clears throat> uh, corporals there said to me, do you know Foreign Minister Pig Bota? And I said, no. And he said, well, he's asked to see you, and we've been asked to bring you to him. So I was brought to Foreign Minister Pig Bota of South Africa, and I enter his office, and as I enter his office, he points to a portrait in his office, and he says, you know who that is, don't you? I said, yes, that's Anatoly Sharansky. And he says, right. He says, I could un not understand why somebody like you, who could defend this great hero, Anatoly Sharansky, against our enemy, the communist Soviet Union, can speak in the same breath about Nelson Mandela, who's also a communist and is also our enemy, and went on in this vein. I said, well, Mr. Minister, I have to tell you, both Sharansky and Mandela are fighting for the same thing. They're both fighting for freedom. They're both fighting for democracy. They're both fighting for human rights. He then went on and gave me a, a long lecture on why South African apartheid was really an exercise in democratic pluralism. <laughs> and I said at the end to him, I said, Mr. Bota, I have to tell you, I know that the Soviet Union is a major human rights violator, but I have to say that South Africa is the only post-World War II country that has institutionalized racism as a matter of law. I said apartheid is not just a racist philosophy, though that would be bad enough. It's a racist legal regime. And for so long as it will be necessary, from wherever I am, I will fight against this racist legal regime until it is dismantled. And then he uh, said to me, you know, you are a very brash young man. Maybe I should have let them keep you in that cell or expel you. And then he looks at the portrait and he says, but because of that hero that you defended, <laughs> Anatoly Sharansky, he said, I'm going to let you go free. You go in and about this country for the next 10 days and you come back and you tell me if apartheid is not an exercise in democratic pluralism. So I went about the country, came back and I said, met with him and he said, so young man, what do you have to say? I said, uh, well, you're right. I said, apartheid is an exercise in democratic pluralism. He said, you see, I told you. I said, if you're white, if you're black or colored, it's even worse than I thought. <laughs> well, fast forward uh, to several years ago, I always wondered, you know, what had happened in the interim with Pick Bota? And I was back in South Africa, and I called him, and he was in a senior citizen residence, and not able to receive me. But we had a long talk, and then he sent me an email, and it was a remarkable message. He said, you know, I never forgot our meeting. And then he repeated, I guess, what he remembered from uh, earlier on. He said, you were a very brash young man. He says, so I followed your career since <clears throat> that meeting. He said, but you don't know about me. You, I'd like to tell you that I became the first South African minister in the apartheid government to call for the release of Nelson Mandela. I then became a member of the African National Congress, the anti-apartheid movement, and I ended up being a minister in Nelson Mandela's government. He said, so at the end, we ended up on the same side. And it was a rather remarkable exchange. And as I said when I began, that Pidyon Shvuim is really a remarkable uh, mitzvah with regard to uh, pursuing justice. Now let me turn to the second part of my remarks, because we are meeting today really at a very important historical moment. We're meeting on the 80th anniversary of the coming into effect of the Nuremberg race laws, which became prologue and precursor to the Holocaust. And we're meeting also on the 70th anniversary of the Nuremberg trials, which became the foundation for the development of international human rights, humanitarian, and in particular, international criminal law. And so on this double entendre of Nuremberg, the Nuremberg of hate, and the Nuremberg of Judgments, a group of jurors held an international legal symposium, as I indicated earlier, at Jagiellonia University in Krakow. We had a group of uh, Supreme Court uh, justices there, including the Chief Justice from Rwanda, uh, my colleague from Canada, Justice Rosie uh, Abella. We had the former president of the uh, Supreme Court of Israel, Dorit Benish there. Aaron Barak had been there two years earlier in a similar trip at that time uh, in a march of the living to Asvientium and, and, and Birkenau. 
uh, and we had Lord Dyson from the uh, UK Supreme Court. We had a justice minister's panel. We had a scholar's panel. And at the end of the day, we unanimously adopted this never again declaration. And what I want to do is basically share with you some excerpts of that declaration, because these are not simply declaratory. These are undertakings that we are seeking to get signed by governments, by parliamentarians, uh, by jurists, by leaders of civil society, a critical mass to prevent and combat mass atrocity in our time. So the first of the lessons, and it's a series, the first of the lessons is the danger of forgetting and the importance, the imperative of remembrance of Zahor, as the Czech novelist uh, Milan Kundera put it, that the struggle of freedom against tyranny is a struggle of memory against forgetting. And so the imperative, le devoir de memoir, the duty to remember the millions of victims defamed, demonized, and dehumanized as prologue and justification for their murder. And as Elie Wiesel put it so, so well, that the Holocaust was a war against the Jews in which not all victims were Jews, but all Jews were targeted victims. And as we say at such commemorative events, onto each person there is a name. Each person has an identity. Each person is a universe. And so we recall in this first lesson that which is written both in the Talmud and in the, in the, in the Quran, that if you save a single life, it is as if you have saved an entire universe. Just as if you murder a single person, it is as if you have murdered an entire universe. And so the first lesson that we are each, wherever we are, the guarantors of each other's destiny. The second lesson was the danger of state-sanctioned incitement to hate and to genocide. That the Holocaust and the genocides that followed in Rwanda, in Darfur, occurred not simply because of the machinery of death, but because of state-sanctioned cultures of hate. It is this teaching of contempt, this demonizing of the other, this is where it all begins. As the Supreme Court of Canada put it in one of its uh, judgments upholding the constitutionality of our anti-hate legislation at the time, that the Holocaust did not begin in the gas chamber, said the court, it began with words. And in a judgment, a principle and precedent that deserves being known, let alone followed internationally, the Mugasera case. This was a case where a Rwandan, Leon Mugasera, came to Canada in 1992 from Rwanda, as I mentioned, sought refugee say, status. But as the case unfolded and became clear that he was one of the insiders in Radio Colleen in Rwanda, and so his refugee status became really a extradition issue, and he was charged with uh, crimes against humanity. And in his defense, he said, how could I have been involved in the crimes against humanity in Rwanda, which took place in 1994? I had come to Canada in 1992. I sought refugee status here in 1992. And the court said that the very incitement to hate and genocide constitutes the crime, whether or not acts of genocide follow. A very important precedent for governments and parliaments to follow. In other words, preventing and combating incitement to hate and genocide is not a policy option. It is a legal obligation. A third, and this is a, a third lesson here, and that is the danger of anti-Semitism, the responsibility <coughs> to combat. You know, when we were recently, as part of this International Legal Symposium, we went on the March of the Living. And you go through certain barracks, and in Auschwitz is a barrack which said, 1.3 million people were murdered here in Auschwitz from 41 to 45. 1.1 million of them were Jews. Let there be no mistake about it. Jews were murdered at Auschwitz because of anti-Semitism. But anti-Semitism did not die at Auschwitz. And as we've learned only too tragically and too well, that while it may begin with Jews, it doesn't end with Jews. And Jew hatred is the canary today in the mineshaft 
of global evil. Which brings me now to the fourth lesson and moving to a close. And that is the danger of indifference and inaction in the face of mass atrocity and genocide. You know, I was speaking earlier of Rwanda. As we are meeting, it is the 22nd anniversary of the genocide in Rwanda, where one million Rwandans, mostly Tutsis, were murdered between April 7th and the end of June 1994. What makes that genocide so unspeakable is not only the horror of the genocide. That would be bad enough. What makes it so unspeakable is that this genocide was preventable. Nobody could say we did not know. We knew, but we did not act. Just as with regard to Darfur, we knew, but we did not act. Just as now, as we meet with regard to Syria, we knew, but we did not act. And as we meet, more than 500,000 have been killed in Syria. Over 12.5 million have been displaced and over 5 million refugees. It did not have to be this. You know, I had spent time in Arab countries over the years, including in Syria, and I always felt when the Arab Spring began that there, if there was a place that there was a possibility for some secular democratic movement, at least in Arabic terms, could emerge, it might be in Syria. Perhaps you might be surprised at that. But it was in Syria in March 2011 when a group of young people in Dara, south of Damascus, were walking around with olive branches saying, peace, peace. They were disappeared by the Assad regime. Those who came to support them were gunned down and then began the scorched earth policy of Assad's criminal regime. At the end of that year, there were, quote unquote, only 7,000 dead, quote unquote, only 50,000 that had been displaced. But those of us involved at the time said, inspired also and anchored in the responsibility to protect doctrine, which says that if in any country there are war crimes and crimes against humanity being committed, and God forbid, genocide, and the country in which they are being committed, the government is unable or unwilling to do anything about it, or as in the case of Syria, is the author of those crimes, then as this doctrine unanimously adopted by the UN Security Council in 2005 said, there is a responsibility to intervene and protect those civilians. Well, when we called for intervention in Syria at the time, we were told, you know, if you intervene, this will lead to sectarian warfare, this will lead to civil war, this will lead to jihadists coming in. Everything we were told would happen if we intervened, happened because we didn't intervene. And indifference and inaction in the face of mass atrocity and genocide is much worse than acting and implementing the responsibility to protect doctrine. A fifth lesson is the importance, the dangers of cultures of impunity and the importance of bringing war criminals to justice. If the 20th century was the age of atrocity, it was also the age of impunity. Few of the war criminals were brought to justice. And every time war criminals are not brought to justice, this only emboldens and encourages the next set of war criminals. And so here too, whether we speak of the Nazi war criminals or whether we speak of the war criminals in the killing fields of today, the imperative is to bring them to justice. There are other lessons, but I don't want to go through them uh, singly, other to just for telegraphic, in a telegraphic, just to list them. There are things such as the dangers of la trahison des clercs, the betrayal by the elites. Let there be no mistake about it. The Nuremberg crimes were the crimes of the Nuremberg elites. Doctors, lawyers, judges, engineers, architects, educators, church leaders, and the like. As Elie Wiesel put, put it so well, that with the Nazi elites, they were able to both listen to music and kill children at the same time. And the imperative from then to now, to Assad's criminal regime, uh, to bring these war criminals to justice. Then we have the question of the vulnerability of the powerless and the powerlessness of the vulnerable. The test of a just society is how that just society treats the most vulnerable 
amongst it. It's b refugees, it's immigrants, it's elderly, it's sick, it's poor, it's violated women, it's battered children. You know, <clears throat> my daughter, when she was 15 years of age, she's now 35, she taught me one of the more profound lessons with regard to human rights when she said to me, Daddy, if you want to know what the real test of human rights is all about, always ask yourself at any time, in any situation, in any part of the world, is it good for children? Is what is happening good for children? That's the real test of human rights, Daddy. I might add parenthetically that she said, uh, you're being gone all the time on these cases and causes is not good for your children. But, <laughs> But happily, she and my other uh, children got involved in the uh, cases and causes. And that, for me, uh, I think helps to validate their importance, me door le door, from generation to generation. So let me conclude by saying, and this is how we conclude our never again uh, declaration. We speak about, among other things, the legacy of Holocaust survivors. That's the last of the lessons. And it says we must always remember and celebrate the survivors of the Holocaust, the true heroes of humanity. I would say that with regard and did so when we had a commemorative occasion recently with regard to Rwandans and etc. For they witnessed and endured the worst of inhumanity, but somehow found in the depths of their own humanity the courage to go on, to rebuild their lives as they helped build our communities, whether it be in Montreal or New York or Europe or elsewhere, and certainly here in Israel. Together with them, we must remember and pledge and undertake so that never again will not simply be an idle slogan, that never again will we be indifferent to incitement and hate, that never again will we be silent in the face of evil, that never again will we indulge racism and anti-Semitism, that never again will we ignore the plight of the vulnerable amongst us, that never again will we be indifferent in the face of mass atrocity and impunity, that we will speak up, and most importantly, that we will act against racism, against hate, against anti-Semitism, against mass atrocity, against injustice, against the crime of crimes whose name we should even shudder to mention, genocide. Let this be our commitment and our undertaking. Let this be our tzedek tzedek tirdof, our pursuit of justice. Thank you.